So hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. It's been 24 hours now that I've had the brand new Surface Duo and I have to say that using it outside of obviously Best Buy from the last video that I did for you guys about a week or so ago, it's definitely very different. There's a lot of things that actually look and feel very different when you have it in the hand and obviously are using it as an actual daily driver. So. Today, we're going to cover my 24 hours initial impressions. We're also going to talk about gaming camera performance as well as audio performance and just overall, how does this actually fit into a multitasking uh, basically tool because that's what it's meant for. It's meant to be basically a multitasking tool that will always have a dual display functionality. This is not going to be an accessory. This is exactly how we're intended to use this device. This is TK and this is the Microsoft Surface Duo. Let's check it out. Like and subscribe and make sure you hit that bell icon so that you're always notified to whenever we have new videos on the channel. So as I mentioned to you guys at the beginning, this is exactly 24 hours as since I've had this device. I picked it up yesterday at 10 a.m. and it's about 11.30 the following day. I set it up, I put in my AT&T SIM card in it, and of course I set up all my information in there, my Microsoft account. Uh, but the unboxing experience wasn't actually very bad. Uh, overall, we pretty much get a charger, a USB-C cable, a little bumper case that's included in the box as well with a SIM removal tool. Uh, but other than that, you're pretty much there. Uh, there is no basically a dongle, so you're not gonna be getting kind of any headsets or anything like that. Uh, simple. Uh, the model that I have has six gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of internal storage that is not expandable. And of course, the 855 is the processor that we have here. Since uh, this device has technically been in development for over a year, so the processor on it, even though it's about a year old, it's still a very capable processor. So you may have noticed that I have the Surface Pen here. This is not included in the box and it's actually sold as part of a Surface uh, notebook. So if you have a laptop from Microsoft that has the Surface Pen, this is going to work with it the same way as you normally would use it with your phone uh, or your laptop. The main difference though is that you do need to buy it as a separate accessory and uh, surprisingly there is actually a magnet here for it to actually sit on the phone although it's not really intended to be there permanently so the magnet will work you are able to basically set it directly on the table or using it but unfortunately uh, it kind of comes off right away but again a very nice accessory to pick up with the Surface Duo in case you'd like to be able to take some notes as uh, this actually will register writing on both sides of the display. So meaning I can actually use my pen here to take no notes. So let's go ahead and open up the dual app right here. So let's say here we have Google Hangouts. I'll go ahead and open up a new page. And then we're gonna just basically tap the pen here. You'll notice it automatically switched and we're just gonna see, hello. You can see, and it works really, really nice. Pen input supported on uh, both displays and it works really nice. The touch responsiveness here on the display is actually pretty good. I've been using it again for the last 24 hours. My initial hands-on with this unit or with a unit like this at Best Buy was running early software. So that's one thing to start off. We'll go ahead and talk about the actual build number that we have on this device. And then we'll go down here. Build number is 2020.812.86. Um, I did log in with my Microsoft account as well as my Google account since this actually is a Surface, obviously. So it works with Microsoft tools. So you have a suite of suite, uh, applications directly for Microsoft. So OneNote, Outlook, Edge, of course, uh, Teams, OneDrive, Skype is also included, although not downloaded. And of course, you have the to-do list and all of that stuff. All of those are Microsoft apps. And of course, we now have Google apps. So a little bit of double uh, situation here, but again, depending on your ecosystem, you'll be comfortable using either one. Uh, the UI that we have here is basically running over Android 10.0. So no Android 11 yet, or mentions of that, but the UI is actually very nice. So let's go ahead and actually switch through. So you'll notice here, you're able to swipe through, open up different screens. We have somewhat of a, like a today now option here on the left side that you're also able to use. And uh, one thing that I did notice, you're able to actually kind of swipe the actual icons. So let's go ahead and swipe them back here. And you're actually putting them on one screen or the other. Also, the app drawer is an uh, open up option here that you can do it on the right, or you can open it up on the left and when you open it on each side it'll switch you notice there's a little bit of a few bugs here in the ui and that's something that i feel like still needs to be worked on uh, recent applications swipe up from the center there's a little bit of a delay you can swipe through you can see all the different applications that i've been using and of course you can go home gestures are supported right out of the box and of course a notification panel will open on both sides of the screen uh, the actual uh, indicators that we see here is actually what we have so i'll go ahead and turn off wi-fi I am able to get 5GE on this device. This is a 4G LTE model, not a 5G device. So we are not gonna be receiving 5G or true 5G, at least even on AT&T, but 5GE is what we're able to see. And as you can see right there, the 5GE moniker is sitting right there. I did a couple of speed tests, about 20 megabits down and about uh, two or three up. And I'm thinking just mostly because of the uh, signal strength of where I am. 
Uh, for me at home though with AT&T, since I don't have a strong signal, I always like to stay on Wi-Fi. And as I mentioned to you guys at the beginning, this is running the Snapdragon 855. So an 855 processor, six gigs of RAMs, 128 gigs of internal storage that is not expandable. So there's no SD option. And again, 4G LTE, no 5G model. Uh, no buttons on the top. On the right side, we pretty much have a volume rocker, a power button, and the fingerprint sensor that doubles as a power button, and a single SIM uh, card slot in here. So you're able to put in a SIM card in here. I did have my AT&T slot in there. Last thing on the bottom, all we have is a USB-C type uh, port that's going to be for charging, uh, data transfer, as well as uh, obviously being able to actually use headphones. So if you have USB-C headphones, this is going to work great. Uh, the charger that we have in the box is an 18 watt charger so no fast charging sadly so that's something to keep in mind uh, we have the moniker the windows moniker here and no mention of android at all even though this is running android 10.0 and of course we have that really nicely designed hinge on the back it pretty much is just a blank slate uh, the device opens up in a book style so it works exactly like this and it is intended to basically have a fingerprint sensor on the right very nice you're able to use it in almost any position so i can actually use it as a single display so i'll go ahead and swipe, go back home and as, if I open it in this position, it automatically turns off the screen on the other side. But if I switch the device, I can double tap and it actually switches it over to become the main screen. And it works the exact same screen here. I can double tap and it opens it up right away. Uh, this actually becomes very functional when you're playing games. And I'll show that to you guys in a second when we start talking about the games that I have on here. But overall, the UI pretty much runs the same. You're able to open up windowed applications. So normally like Android, uh, you can but you're also able to have certain sets of uh, preset configured dual apps. And what they call them here essentially is the learn, the plan, the discover and share. And I created a few other ones for myself. So like that, for me, I like to actually use Twitter and Instagram at the same time as those are two of my favorite social media applications that I like to actually stay up to date with. So for the most part, you can see here, Instagram is running on the left. I'm able to interact with it. I'm able to go up and down, check out basically all the stuff. And I just posted an image there for the Poco X3 NFC. And of course, we can do the same thing here with it. Now, the cool thing about it is I'm actually able to throw applications from one screen to the other by just flicking them. Or if I want to be able to run them as dual screen, I can actually run them in this form factor. So you notice Instagram automatically opened up in this form as it's actually intended to work much better in this form factor. Uh, and of course, when I want to be able to switch back, I do want to keep in mind that the gestures, even though the actual window became more of a lengthwise, the actual gestures are still present here on the right side. So you still have to interact with it as if you're using Android 10.0 gestures. And that's sadly something to do with the limitations of Android uh, and the way it actually is intended. It's not really configured to work with two displays, specifically the way we have things here. So Microsoft has had to do a lot of optimizations to get this thing to run. So swiping up from the side gets us into the recent application. We're able to basically open up things the way we normally do. If you want to create one of your own groups, just go in directly into the app drawer, press and hold on the actual app that you want to group and you go into it and hit group. And it'll give you the option of selecting another app to actually combine it with. So an example would be here. Let's say we'll go ahead and open it up with meet. I'll say done. And basically I can swap them. So basically it's telling me which window to put it in and just say okay for it. Once that's done, you'll notice it adds it right there. And the next time I click that, it's going to open up both of those applications in the normal form factor. The one thing I do want to mention is that this device only has one camera. It's a camera that's present right there. It's an 11 megapixel camera. Right next to that, we have a dual tone LED flash. And that's the only camera that we have here. So if I go into the camera application, I open it once, it automatically opens in selfie mode. If I want to use it in the actual form factor of most smartphones, I'll go ahead and turn it on. And you'll notice that the camera now switches over to being on the back. So this is how we would be able to use it on the standard form. If I switch it over to the other side and it does automatically switch over to selfie mode, switch it over to the other side, it'll automatically, and it's supposed to do it automatically. We'll do it one more time. And this is some of those little hiccups in the UI you'll notice right there. But again, nothing that they couldn't fix in software. It works nicely. The camera itself produces decent pictures. I wouldn't say that these are going to be the best pictures that you're able to provide. Um, I did take a selfie picture and I posted it over on Instagram. Unfortunately, the colors didn't look super sharp, but it definitely was okay. So what I mean by this is I think this camera was mostly intended to be used for video conferencing and just general every once in a while document scanning or taking pictures of a document. It's not really meant to be a very high functioning camera. So what I'm showing you guys right now is a quick demo of a quick clip that I did here. I used uh, Google Meets and I was able to actually do a quick video between two of my accounts. The overall image looks a lot better on the Duo since I was using it with the uh, S20 Ultra. On the Duo, the image didn't look too bad, but it looked a little bit washed out. But again, the positioning of it, it works really nice. 
And the good thing about the actual UI, the way we have it here, you're able to basically position the camera in whatever point you want to use it. And of course, you can actually tilt it up as an actual laptop and work with it very nicely. So one thing that we can do definitely very unique to the Duo is the fact that if we actually tilt the device sideways, it actually takes us into a basically almost like a laptop experience. So in this situation, I'm actually able to type in using the keyboard. I can actually interact with it, get everything done correctly. Or if I want to go all the way full screen here, but then actually I can position the, the actual app in the middle, I can open up the keyboard and it'll open it up for me in both sides. I can have it on the right or on the left. And of course, I can actually make it into a full screen option if I want to and then go back into the main screen. Uh, the really nice in thing about the UI here is that you're able to use it to whichever form that you want to use it in. Um, now, applications, as I mentioned, you guys will run in full screen if you want them. So an example would be here. Let's go ahead and open up Netflix. And by default, Netflix will open up to half of it. So it intends to automatically open up in one app. And of course, I can actually position it in the middle and it will open up in almost like a tablet style experience. You are still going to have that line in the middle since these are two separate screens. There is actually no way to kind of go around it. But the UI actually does a decent enough job to actually aggregate the content around it. So you notice right there where I'm able to go through by default, it's separated to three, three, and it kind of works the same way. Now, as far as actually watching video on this, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the sound and we'll go ahead and jump over to Cobra Kai. Now, because I had it in full screen, the video is going to play full screen for me. And this is something that you're able to do. You'll notice that the, the pause button is actually sitting in the middle. This is something that you have to be OK with. If you are not OK and you want to be able to just use it in normal form factor, you can actually play the video standard normal form factor like this. So the video will play at the top. We'll go ahead and play the video. And you're able to basically at this point do other things. So we'll go ahead and open up Twitter. As I'm watching the video there, I'm actually able to interact and the video doesn't pause. So this is something that we saw with uh, the LG Velvet or the LG V60 is that the video for some reason after the latest update from uh, Netflix stopped the interface. So in essence, we weren't really running two apps all the time. It actually put one app in pause. So for me now, I can actually basically put the video, I can start it up and I can still interact with whatever other application I want to do. And it works really, really nice. Uh, conversely, you can also still use the full screen. So let's go ahead and switch up. And what I mean by this essentially is the windowed or the pop-up options. I'm able to actually move it from one screen to the other. Let's go ahead and bring it in here. And of course, when I'm done, just swipe it away and it'll actually close it. So that works again, same way with YouTube, and it'll do the exact same experience with everything else. Um, no face unlocking in here, only fingerprint as well as pin. And uh, the wallpaper setup that you have here, you have to be a little bit considerate with the fact that when you change the wallpaper on here, you do need to change it for both screens. It doesn't actually do a good job of separating the screens as far as wallpapers. So when you jump into the UI, you have the ability of adding a widget or changing wallpapers. You go into wallpaper change. You have, you'll have the option of configuring the lock screen or the home screen. So we'll go into the home screen and you have access to some surface images, uh, Bing images, colors, or basically your own photos. But again, keep in mind that if you do use some of your own photos, an example, let's say, go ahead, we'll do this one. Uh, it actually splits it between both screens. You can kind of see where that seam is landing. So if I do that and hit next, it's asking me where do I want to apply it on the lock screen or on the home screen or even both. Uh, and if you do that, it will apply it, but you'll end up having that seam that we were talking about. So as you can see right there, I can lock it, unlock it, and you'll still have the lock screen. And of course, when I go into the home screen, we now have this Android circuit board, which I feel like looks really nice with the memory socket sitting on the right. So customizations are pretty standard, very similar to the way we see it with Android 10. Uh, 10. So there's a lot of cool things going on in there, but, but let's go waste any time. Let's go ahead and start talking about gaming and how does it actually work on our Surface Duo? So right now I have a couple of uh, first person shooter games. So Call of Duty, PUBG Mobile are my main games. And of course we played a little bit of Asphalt 9. Uh, gameplay on one screen is absolutely fantastic. The 855 is way uh, more powerful than what we need to play either one of these games. Six gigs of RAM with 128 gigs of internal storage, more than enough to be able to download the full game and run it very nicely. So gaming on this uh, was actually a little bit of a mixed bag. You can either play games on the device using the single screen on the front, and that means the sound is moving away from you. So for me, what I recommend doing is always using the second display or the display on the left with the speaker in it to play games because that produces the sound and it produces it directly at you, making it a much better gaming experience. So that's one of the things that we can talk about. The other thing we also need to talk about is how do you play games on this, either full screen or even single screen option? So. Um, using them as a single screen, there's no difference between this and any other smartphone other than the uh, aspect ratio of a 5.6 inch display. So keep in mind when you open it all the way, you have an 8.3 inch display, but a single one is a 5.6 and it's not necessarily a 16 by nine. So that's one of the things you want to keep in mind. So your field of view is definitely better. The play playability of the game is actually very, very nice. And depending on the game that you're using, you're able to switch between the front display and the back display very easily. So 
For me, when I was playing with uh, basically PUBG, that had no problems at all. I was able to switch between the front and the back very easily. And the same thing was going on with Asphalt 9. Um, Asphalt 9 was actually running very, very nice and the responsiveness of the actual UI was very good. The display is very good as far as the quality of the images. Uh, we were able to play with high quality on both PUBG, Call of Duty, as well as Asphalt, and there was no problem. So for me, gaming on this is not going to be a problem. The concern that comes here is when you start playing it in full screen and you have that seam in the middle of your display. It's not an issue for maybe general, uh, maybe if you're playing basically open world type of experience, but if you're playing first person shooters where generally your crosshairs or your firing mechanism in the game is automatically set to be in the dead center of your display, because that's generally where it does, uh, you're going to have some problem being able to find exactly that sp spot. So for me, gaming on this, I probably would say uh, first person shooters always play it on one or the other screen, but don't play it in full screen. And if you're playing like racing type games where you don't necessarily care too much about the center, that's going to work really nice. And it actually gives you a much better gaming experience. And the speaker will be facing you in that experience. So very, very nice as far as gaming, no problems at all. But I'll be working a little bit more on this later on when I get a chance to actually spend some more time with it. So definitely a very good gaming experience when it comes down to this. Again, you just need to figure out the exact form factor that works for it best for you. Either the right display, left display, or the full display. But let's go ahead and talk about the camera and the camera application that we have in here. Again, as I mentioned to you guys, we have a single camera. It's an 11 megapixel camera capable of shooting 4K 60 frames per second for video. We're able to do photo stills, uh, portrait imagery, panorama. I'm showing you guys a couple of samples of those images. It's not going to produce the best images. It's not going to give us the most astonishing camera performance. But I feel like for what it actually is here really for video calls and basically a casual image taking, this is going to work well. Uh, the problem that we get we face with it is that it's not easily accessible most of the time the device is closed so it means when i want to take a picture i want to open up the device wait for the ui to wake up open up the camera and then wait for it to wake up so now it's working in front facing display i want to be able to take a picture of something right there now it's facing me now i have to switch it over and now at this point i need to take this image so all of this had to happen before i was able to snap an image so that's why I'm thinking this is really more of a productivity type of a tool, not necessarily a, a casual image taking, but it definitely works if you need it and it'll do the job. Um, it just, again, don't expect astonishing images or video. Let's jump in real quick to a sample of the front facing video. Uh, well, actually the only camera video that we have on this camera. So I wanted to give you guys a quick sample of the video and the audio directly from the camera, the single camera that we have here on the Surface Duo. It's an 11 megapixel camera that can give us 4K 60 frames per second, which is what I'm recording at right now. Here's the caveat. Even though there's an option in the settings that says stabilization, the video right now out of the actual device is extremely jittery if you don't have it on a flat surface. So my recommendation would be is if you're going to use this, you can use as high of a megapixel as you can, but make sure you have it stabilized in some way or form. Hopefully a software update can provide us better stabilization. Uh, but other than that, again, one camera that you can use on the front and on the back that gives you 4K 60 frames per second is actually something that is nice. We don't have to worry about two different sensors. The downside of it, of course, is the fact that we only have one sensor and then every time we need to use it, we have to do that flipping over for us to be able to use like a regular handheld camera. For the most part, I think this is going to be great for video conferencing, but I think that's the extent of it. Uh, casual images, that's it, but I wouldn't necessarily say this is the best camera. This is just okay for video conferencing and casual pictures. So when it comes down to the speaker, we're talking about a single firing speaker that's present on the top left. I'm going ahead and put the volume all the way up to 100%. We're going to play Jumbo by Alex Grindo, my favorite song. First thing we want to talk to you guys about the UI. Overall, it opens up automatically on one side. You're able to flick it from one side to the other, or you're also able to make it into full screen. So you can actually watch it full screen in this form, or if you tilt it upside down, give it a second to orient, it'll actually give you more of a, almost like a desktop experience of what YouTube looks like. Uh, for me, on video, I like to see the biggest image possible, so we'll go ahead and say full screen, and we'll go ahead and play. You'll notice that the play but pause button is actually in the middle between the two displays, so you just have to remember where it is, and it'll work just fine. So let's go ahead and bring up the song.
So as you can see here, the experience is pretty much tailored to the way YouTube normally works. I think uh, the seam in between the two displays is definitely there. You just need to be able to be okay with it. And if you do actually use it this way, you're obviously able to get a much bigger display to use to watch content, movies, and so on. And of course, uh, personally, I feel like Bluetooth headsets are intended to be used with this. Uh, wired ones are not going to be very functional, mostly because if you're setting it up this way, it's going to be very hard for the actual wire to be able to work here, even if you're using USB-C. So my recommendation with this, definitely use a pair of headphones. So for gaming, I would probably use a USB-C connection, but as far as video, definitely go with Bluetooth. So as far as my impressions after using it for the last 24 hours, um, First things first, I'll say this. At the time that I got a chance to spend some time with it at Best Buy, I was very impressed with the form factor, but it was tethered, right? I wasn't able to put it in my pocket. I wasn't able to walk around, answer calls, make calls from it, do different things that I normally do with a smartphone. How does this actually make sense? So. Out of the box, I chose not to use the bumper mostly because I just wanted to be able to use it. This is actually glass on glass, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So the protection you have on the inside is the same as the one you have on the outside. So you're actually pretty much experiencing the same thing. Um, you are able to actually keep it unfolded the whole time. This is not gonna hinder the, the performance. Uh, you're able to turn off the display on both sides and just put that in your pocket. Um, although keep in mind, if there's any sands or things like that, that's gonna take, well, that's actually gonna come with time, obviously, since 24 hours, not enough time for me to do any kind of physical damage. Uh, not that I'm trying. Uh, so the initial impressions I would say is definitely very positive. It needs a little bit more work when it comes down to the software. It is light years improvement where, from what I saw originally with the uh, Best Buy model as this actual UI is usable. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and that also makes sense why it installed the update right before I was even able to use it. Uh, the integration with the Microsoft uh, suite of applications is also very nice. The dual applications work very good. Uh, I feel like the pen input is also a nice must if you like writing. So this is going to definitely be really good. Uh, but it is very similar to the way that Samsung uh, does it on their devices. So you're getting pretty much kind of, um, I would say, basically, you know, writing on glass experience. So it's going to be a lot of gliding. But again, definitely very nice. If you're used to using the Surface Pen on a Surface Book, this is gonna work pretty much the same. So would I recommend anybody picking this up at this point? I probably would say I, it depends on what you need and what you're looking for. If A, you're an early adopter, you always like to be running with the latest tech, I feel like this is something definitely to check out. It's a little bit hard to find now because they don't. I don't think they made a lot of them. They're also selling out very quickly. So something to keep in mind. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, but you are within an area where they have to say there's a Best Buy and you're able to go in and check it out, definitely go down there and spend some time with it, see how it is, and see if this is something that will interest you. It sells for $13.99 right now. After taxes for me, at least here in California, it was around $1,500. So that's something to keep that in mind. Um, it's very good, getting a lot better, and I feel like software can do a lot more improvements on here. This is something that I would say very much fits into the uh, Windows kind of ecosystem. And what I mean by this essentially is that Windows will always basically get better as time goes on because we get updates. So again, same scenario, same situation. I wouldn't put it any different. Um, it is very nice, definitely an expensive phone for what you're getting there. Obviously, we're not looking at the latest specs, but we're looking at a very powerful multitasking tool. The ability of running dual applications easily by just pairing them and launching them, forcing us to use a dual display uh, device all the time is something that is also going to hopefully force developers to start recognizing that dual display devices are existing and they're going to be produced. And of course, that will transfer obviously over to LG since LG already has as an accessory to their V60 and the Velvet and the G8X or even the V50 uh, additional screens that for some reason weren't being supported a lot. Now we have Microsoft in the game and of course all of that will change once you have, again, such a big company in the actual uh, realm of dual display devices. So let me know in the comments below, what do you guys think of the Surface Duo? Is this something that interests you? Or are you basically still on the fence thinking that, you know, obviously the Z Fold 2 is definitely the way to go. Uh, as usual, thank you very much for the support. Like and subscribe as usual, and I'll see you guys in the next video.